obvious transportation one. But there are lots of other algorithm problems that come down the shortest path. I wanted to try to show you the telephone code reconstruction to try to motivate that. Okay? But finding the right graph and running shortest path on it can do you good things. But let's now think of how we find shortest path. And for unweighted graphs, you guys should know how to find shortest path. How do you find shortest path on an unweighted graph? Breadth first search, OK? Breadth first search gives you, you start out at some point. Essentially, you're walking all possible paths radiating out from that vertex. We are following up in terms of its distance, OK? And um, that gives us the, the tree of discovery, tells us for every vertex in the graph, what is the distance, the, shor of the, sh the length of the shortest path from that vertex to the root of our search, OK? Any questions? Now, to respect this, maybe now you say, oh, I know about breadth first search. This isn't so easy. This is no big deal. Breadth first search is actually solving a problem that could be very, very dangerous if you didn't solve it in the right way. Is breadth first search showing you all the possible, going through all possible paths in the graph? Let's think about this. Suppose I gave you a graph that looked like this. It was this diamond colored thing, right? Here's my start vertex. Here's my end vertex. What's the length of the shortest path in terms of number of edges from S to T? It's two times the number of these triangular di di diamond-like gizmos, right? Four gizmos, two times four. The length of the shortest path is eight. Does everybody agree with that? Now, suppose we try to enumerate the number of paths, OK, from S to T. How many paths are there of that length from S to T? OK? We have, let's say, G gizmos. Here, G equals 4, the number of these diamond-shaped gizmos. How many shortest paths are there from S to T? OK? I claim at each point, I could either go up or down. And it will give me a path of the same length. Does everybody agree with that? So how many paths are, shortest paths are there from S to T? Two to the number of gizmos, right? There would be two to the G. Different paths, shortest paths. So if you enumerated all the paths across the graph, that would be exponential. Does everybody see that? So breadth first search is not doing that. Breadth first search is visiting all the edges, but it is not visiting all the paths. OK? And that's something to register here, right? It's saying, what is breadth first search saying? I'm starting here. This vertex and this vertex are a distance one, right? Let's go do it with our discovery, right? I discover this vertex. I discover that vertex. From here, I explore. I discover that vertex. Oh, everything here already leads me to something that's discovered. I'm not going to care about that anymore, right? From here, discover, discover. From here, discover. From here, oops, did no need to discover it anymore. Does everybody see what I'm doing? I am discovering. I am working out the discovery thing. But what breadth first search is really going to be giving me is, in some sense, the sh length of the shortest path from S to T. It is giving me one of those shortest paths, but not all of them. Does everybody see that? How many people see that? OK, and people don't see that. And this is important because if somebody comes to you and demands, I don't want to see that one shortest path. I want to see all of them, OK? Then realize you have to tell them well, that's nice, but you realize you might get an exponential number of paths. Someone says, I don't care. I want to see all two to the end paths if necessary. Well, start it running and then walk out of the room and let them look at it. Okay? 
because there's going to be it could be a huge number of fasts that are going to keep you very busy for a long time. Any questions about that? Okay. So what do we need to know about fr about shortest path from the unweighted case? In an unweighted graph, we can do it, okay, easily in linear time, okay. But we're not finding all shortest paths, only a representative shortest path. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about that? Now, it should be clear, and maybe just uh, at the risk of detail this one more time, it should be clear that breadth first search gives me, if I gave it a weighted graph, it would give me the path with the smallest number of, of edges. Okay, between two vertices. Let's say this was S, this is T. Here there's a bunch of edges of weight 1. Here there is an edge of weight 1 and an edge of weight 1,000. If we ignore the weights, what will breadth search give us as the shortest path from S to T? It would give us this one. Does everybody agree with that? Whereas if we if we take a look at what is really the, the shortest path between these two, it is the one that uses more edges. If the edges have different weights, the one with the smallest number of turns is not necessarily the shortest weighted path. Does everybody see that? OK, and it can get arbitrarily bad if I can set whatever I want on that graph. Any questions about that? So how, let, let's go through, OK, fair enough. Any questions about that? Okay, good. Let's think a little bit. We talked about negative edge weights next time. How would you find shortest path? Let's think now about the problem from scratch before I show you the algorithm. Here is a weighted graph. 5, 10, 20, 20, whatever you want, whatever weights you want. How would you find, can someone give me an algorithm or an idea of an algorithm? to find the shortest path from S to T, OK? Any ideas how you might go about it, OK? Let's think about it. Someone afraid. How might you, someone want to suggest a way you might do it? Yes, you. Find the vertex with the most connections. Again, I want to find the shortest path from S to T. I'm not sure I know what most connections means. What do you mean by most connections? OK, not sure I'm understanding that. OK, let me go on to that. What was yours? So what you might say is, I'm not sure what you said. You might be saying, start out with every, with S. Find the shortest, where can I get to as quickly as possible? And then maybe start from here and say, where can I get to as quickly as possible? Is that what you're saying? Look, I can get to this guy at three more. Now, get from this guy. Where can I get to as quickly as possible? Where can I get to as quickly as possible? Where can I get to as quickly as possible? Yes, I did find where I was going eventually, right? In this case, I happened. OK? Do you believe that's the shortest path? No. OK? Anybody have any other ideas as to how we might find the shortest path in the graph? Yes. OK. Let's think, you said, like Prim's algorithm, OK? That's an interesting idea. What does that actually mean? Let's draw another graph and see what you mean by it, like Prim's algorithm. Now, Prim's algorithm, we add in minimum spanning tree. We started out at some vertex. Let's say we started out here, and we did what? We took the edge that was closest to us, right? OK, let's say this was 4. 1, 7, 2, 3, 6. 1, 3, 4, 2, 3, T. 
what would now the idea be? Now we know the shortest, now, now we've taken that edge. What would Prim's algorithm now do? Prim's algorithm for minimum spanning tree would now find which edge vertex is the closest vertex, where is the edge is of lowest weight linking somebody that is in the tree so far to somebody on the outside. Does everybody agree that's what Prim's algorithm would do? It would say the next thing to take would be this edge. Okay? And we see this builds us a minimum spanning tree, right? But we're not interested in minimum spanning tree now. We're interested in finding the shortest path. Actually, we are interested in finding a tree, though. Didn't we see in breadth first search how a tree could be used to give us shortest path to everybody? Right? Isn't that what, 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 what we did? We did have a tree. And we did have a tree rooted in somebody. That was breadth first search, right? Now, is Prim's algorithm the minimum spanning tree? If we both use Prim's algorithm, is that always going to give us the shortest path to a node? The answer is no. Can anyone construct an example where Prim's algorithm would not give me the shortest path to a node? Let's think about it. Okay, can anybody, if I were going to do one right, right now, what if I did something like this, S? Here I have something of weight 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, weight 2. What is Prim's algorithm going to do? I want to find the shortest path from S to T, right? What is Prim's algorithm going to do? This looks good. Mm. And now the shortest path from S to T in the tree is bop, 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 4. Everybody see that? So the minimum spanning tree is the tree of lowest weight. But that tree doesn't give me the um, shortest path from S to T. Does everybody see that? What would be the shortest path tree that I would want? The shortest path to get to, to T here is, in fact, that thing of length 2, right? The shortest thing to get from S to everybody else, I think that this is the graph that I would want. Does everybody see that? This is the tree of discovery, right? It takes three units to get to here. It takes two units to get to here. One unit to get to there and two units to get to there. Does everybody see that? It's not what? You can't? OK. Any questions about that? So Prim's algorithm is not quite doing the right thing. Why isn't it doing the right thing? OK. Yes. You're saying it's because it's going to all the vertices. And that, I argue, isn't the right answer. Because in some sense, we want to go to all the vertices eventually and come up with the shortest path three. OK, just like breadth first search had a shortest path three. The reason you know, breadth first search visit built, told us the shortest path from the root to everybody. And that was linear, and that was nice. OK, yes. OK, I mean, it's about the shortest, what, yeah? You're saying it's only making, um, it's greedy and it's making a local choice. One way to think about it is that it is it's looking for the cheapest edge it can add on, okay, rather than the cheapest way of getting there. That's actually probably what I would be saying, right? Prims is busy saying, give me another edge, give me another edge, okay? It's saying, what's the cheapest way I can add somebody to the graph? Not the cheapest way I can get to a vertex. OK? Any questions? Yeah. So 
now what you're saying is, well, why don't I go do something and then backtrack and erase things? And you have to be careful now that you're doing this right. Okay? So the question of can you? The answer is maybe. Can I? I don't know how to do it. Okay? Any questions? But let me now show you, because it turns out that something very close to Prim's algorithm is the answer. Okay? Amazingly close to Prim's algorithm. It's something called Dijkstra's algorithm. Why is it called Dijkstra's algorithm? Because Dijkstra figured this out, okay? Now, it may have been Prim actually, I think, figured it out earlier, but, but Dijkstra was a better talker than Prim, or something like that. But Dijkstra got the fame for this. And the idea of, of, of Dijkstra's algorithm is we are, instead of each round going to be claiming another cheap edge, what we're going to be doing is, in each round, we're going to add one to the set of vertices such that we know the cheapest path to it. Okay? That's what we're going to do here. Okay? So let's look at an example. Let me, you know, let me I think I may have an example. Do I have an example here? Let me do an example here. Suppose we want to look at this graph A, uh, starting from vertex A. And we want to, in each round, claim another vertex as our choice that we know the shortest path to it. Which vertex can we look at this graph and say we know the shortest path from A to it? Which vertex? I didn't label them. But I claim this edge of weight 5 guarantees us the shortest path from A to this vertex. OK? Why if we just look at this? Actually, again, it's terrible. I'm covering up something with my hand in the hopes that you're seeing it. OK? So that doesn't do any good. Suppose we don't look at this part of the graph yet, right? Why do I know that the shortest path to this vertex has to be this direct edge from A to that vertex? Okay. Look at the weights of it, but what does it mean exactly? Yeah. It's the shortest edge from A to A to B, from A to somebody, right? If I want to get out of town from A, what's the cheapest way I can get out of A? I can go someplace at 5, someplace at 7, someplace at 12. Does everybody believe it? Suppose there was another shorter way to get from A to this guy. I would have had to have left some other vertex Does every, through, through somebody else, right? Suppose I tell you there's a shorter way to this guy chugging through that. How much have I paid so far? Seven. How can I have a cheaper path to this vertex than something that costs five if I've already paid seven to get there? Does everybody agree with that? I paid seven and I'm only part of the way there. How could I possibly be cheaper? Five. Well, it could be if I had an edge here that was minus three. Does everybody agree with that? How do I avoid that problem? I said I was not going to allow any negative weight edges. Remember I was talking about that last time? Now there's no negative weight edges in my graph, right? And now you see why it makes a difference, right? Because now I know the shortest path from A to this A to this vertex here, right? Because I paid five to get there. I'm here in, in five, and everybody else is going to cost me more than five to get to them. Does everybody agree with that? So there is no possibility I can find a shorter route that goes through anybody else. Does everybody see that idea? So what am I going to do here? I claim now I know the shortest way to get here. I can get here at a cost of 5. What other vertex can I next claim? 
is the shor- I, I know the shortest way to get to. Okay? Which one is a logical? I want to get from A. What other vertex is then cheapest to get to? The one at the cost of seven, right? Now, why do I know that there is not a cheaper way to get to this vertex of weight that, than seven? It's possible I could have gone through, either I had a direct edge, going through this guy of weight 12 wouldn't have helped me at all, right? That's, that's, that's a non-starter. But maybe if I went through the vertex of five, I could do better, right? But from five, what do I know? I know a way to get here at cost less than or equal to 12, and a way to get from here at a cost of less than or equal to 14. Does everybody agree with that? This one gives me a cost of seven. The cheapest cost to get to this vertex down here is it's the cost is less than or equal to 12, right? I'm gonna keep bounds on. What is the best way that I know how to get there? And one by one, roll up the cost of it. What is the next vertex that I know the cheapest way to get to? Let's think about that, okay? Who should I be using now, okay? From this vertex of seven, I could get to here in seven plus four. Hmm, I can get to here in 11. I could get from here less than or equal to 10, right? I could get from here in less than or equal to 11. Who is the next guy that I would claim as being one I know the shortest path to? Which one? The, the one with, the sta- with, 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 with this one. Does everybody agree with that? I have a way of getting there at a cost of 10, and there is no other vertex in this graph I can hope to get to at a cost of less than 10. Right? Everybody see that? What about from number 10? What Now that I'm here, where can I go? I can get from here to this guy at a cost of 12, but big deal, I've already got know how to get there at 11, right? He doesn't help me. I can get to this guy at a cost of less than or equal to 12. I can get to this guy at a cost of less than or equal to 17. Well, that doesn't look interesting at all to me, right? Which is the next vertex I know the shortest path to? Which cost? 11, which one do I want? Uh, let me tell you, they're both 11. Why don't I claim this one? From 11, I now know what? I now know another way to get to here at a cost of 16, right? Doesn't sound so interesting to me, right? From here, I know a way to get to here at a cost of 11. Now what? Okay, from here, I can get to, well, I can't get to anybody else interesting, right? Here I can get to it at a cost of 12. This is my shortest path spanning tree. Does everybody see that? And the goal here is at each iteration, I'm gonna claim one other vertex as being one that I know the shortest path from the root to it. Okay, any questions? Any questions about that idea? So let's go back. From the, I'm, I'm count, calculating the distance from the pro starting node, the root, to everybody else in the graph. If I get the shortest path from me to everybody else in the graph, I will find the shortest path from me to the target, right? Does everybody agree with it? If I only cared about the target, once I found the shortest path from me to the target, I could knock off, okay? But in the worst case, that's not gonna help me turns out. Okay? Any questions? So what is the principle of Dijkstra's algorithm? It says that if, well, I have a couple ways to think about it. If the shortest path from S to T goes through X, then I'd better find the shortest path from S to X 
before I find the shortest path from S to T. Does that make sense? If you're promising me the shortest path from here to California, and I'm going to have to drive through Manhattan, the shortest path to do the entire trip will include the shortest path from me to Manhattan. Does everybody agree with that? It took me longer to get to Manhattan. It's going to take me longer to get to California than I need to. OK? So we're going to store the shortest distance from S to everybody. And one by one, use the shortest paths we've built so far to find the shortest path to more distant nodes. OK? Any questions about the philosophy? So what we're going to do is the following kind of a data structure, OK? And it's going to be exactly like Prim's. If you're telling me, oh, I'm, I'm getting nervous. It's exactly like Prim's, except for a very, very small change. We're going to start out by saying that the shortest path from vertex S to itself is a distance of 0. Does everybody agree with that? To get from me to where, where I am to where I am, I don't have to do anything, right? If we add all edge weights as positive, the smallest edge incident upon our source defines the distance from S to that vertex. Does everybody agree with that? If we don't have any negative weights to come by and give me a shortcut, if this is the cheapest edge that's incident to S, I now know the shortest path from S to X. Any questions? Keep track of a fringe, or a, a uh, record here, storing what is the length of the shortest path from S to everybody. Until we know better, the shortest path we know of is infinite, OK? Until we discover a path to it. And then what we're going to do is, once we add another vertex x to our tree of guys we know the shortest path to, we're then going to look and see, is there any good that comes of now knowing the shortest path from x? Namely, to go from x to somebody else. Because if there is a shortest path to a neighbor of x that goes through x, well, basically, it's going to be the shortest path to x plus that extra edge. Any questions here? OK. Any questions about that? So the Dijkstra's algorithm is just like Prim's algorithm, except for one thing, OK? Again, we start out, we only know our roots. We keep track of the distance to every vertex. Originally, it's infinite if we don't have an edge to it, OK? Then basically, the last vertex we added to the tree Look at all the outgoing edges from that. OK, first we're going to select okay. we're going to select the vertex of minimum cost that isn't yet in the tray. Add that guy to the tray. Then once we have our new vertex V in the tray, we're going to see what the consequences of that are. And that means for every edge going out of V, to some vertex x, the distance to x is either the previous shortest distance we had to x, or the shortest path we can find going through our new vertex v. Namely, the distance to v, okay, plus the cost of that edge from v to x. Does everybody agree with that? If we have some vertex v and we know how far that vertex is from the root, and we know the edge of this weight, the weight of this edge, the cost of this path to consider is the distance from here to here plus the cost of that extra edge. And that's what we're saying here. And if this is better than the best one we know, take the, the, the new distance as being the, the, the best path we have. Otherwise, stick with the old one. Any questions about that? Any questions? This is for algorithm. 
How much is it Frim's algorithm? In my program for Frim's algorithm, I changed three lines, and it became Dijkstra's algorithm. The program. What was the first line? Well, first thing is I changed the word Dijkstra to Prim, from Prim to Dijkstra, right? So I knew what algorithm it was. OK, that's one change. That's not algorithmically interesting. What is the interesting part that's really significant? All it is really here, where before what Prims was doing was once I had added another vertex to the tree, I looked at all the outgoing edges from it. And before what I said is if the uh, distance, OK, if the fringe weight of this edge, if, if the cheapest way to add this, this vertex to the tree before was bigger than the cost of this edge, switch it to using this edge. Now what I'm doing instead is saying, if the distance to vertex w is greater than the distance to w plus the cost of the edge from v to w, I have found the shorter way to get to w by going through v. So update that. And that is the entire change there. Any questions about that? How many people sort of see this? How many people don't see it? You want a more explanation? So what is the full code doing? Let's go back here just to make sure we understand it. What we're going to start out doing is we are initializing just like Prim. No vertex is in the tray. The distance to everybody is infinite. Nobody has a parent. OK? Well, the start vertex is different. We know the start vertex initialization, right? So that's good. What is the difference? While v is not in the tray, OK? Meaning that, that, that the next vertex we want to add to the tree is not yet there. OK? Put it in the tray. Look through all the outgoing edges of that vertex and update our knowledge, OK, of the shortest path to every else going through V. Once we have that, then we have to figure out who's the next vertex we're adding to the tree. And that is the one we're going to go minimize over all the vertices who is not in the tree yet, and who, but who has the smallest distance of anybody not in the tree. And that's going to identify what the next vertex to add to the tree is for the next iteration. Any questions about that? That is Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay? So if you've got frames, you get Dijkstra's for free, oh, almost free. Any questions about it? OK, so it's worth understanding it. Any questions? OK, the time for Dijkstra's algorithm is exactly the same as for Prim's algorithm. Because all we did was replace a constant time operation with a different constant time operation. OK, we're going to take n iterations. One for each vertex is going to get added. And the cost of doing the update is linear in the number of vertices n times n. That's why it's n squared. Any questions? In fact, there are faster ways to do it if you use fancy enough data structures. But we're not going to go into that here. For your purposes, the fact that you can compute shortest paths in n squared time is a very good thing. Okay, And Dijkstra's algorithm is a way to do it for weighted graphs. Any questions about that? OK. Any questions about that? OK. So that is Dijkstra's algorithm. Um, there are other algorithms for finding shortest paths in graphs that are interesting. Um, one of which, let me decide if I want to go so short. So, there is another 
the shortest, fast problem. I'm not going to go through the algorithm. Okay, I don't think. But the problem is kind of important. Sometimes you might want to know what is the shortest path between every pair of vertices in a graph? Does everybody see this? Why might you want to know? Let's think about it. Normally, if you want to find the shortest path from here to there, this is motivated by transportation. I want to go someplace. What's the shortest way to do it? Why might I be interested in the shortest path between all pairs of vertices in a graph? Networking. Maybe I'd like to know the maximum delay. Okay. Knowing that I, knowing that I'm gonna, I want to know that my network has the property that a message from any place to any place else will get there in a certain number of nanoseconds, right? Okay. Then I want to analyze all possible paths pairs. And that problem we call all pairs shortest path. Okay. I want to know the shortest path from any one vertex to any other vertex. Okay. Any questions? That would the best way to store that result would be a matrix where I have from you know from each one of the vertices here and each one of the vertices here. The ij entry of this matrix is the length of the di is the distance from vertex i to vertex j. Have you ever seen a road map where they give you that kind of matrix on its side? They'll tell you there's a bunch of cities that you can travel in, and they'll tell you between every pair of city what the drive time is or what the distance is. Have you seen a matrix like that? Who's seen one? Okay, I'm not making that up. I mean, a lot of maps have that. Okay, any questions here? Okay. So how might we solve the all pair shortest path problem? Can anybody give me a way to find the shortest path from every vertex to every other vertex? Okay. Yes. Start Dijkstra's algorithm on every vertex. Does everybody see that? Dijkstra's algorithm will tell me. Give me the shortest path from vertex 1 to everybody else. What could I do? Bop, 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 fill in that row. Then start from vertex two, do a Dijkstra's algorithm. Find the shortest path from vertex two to everybody else. Does everybody agree that in n calls to Dijkstra's algorithm, I should be able to find the shortest path between every pair of vertices? Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Bottom line is, by since it took n squared time for, Do, for Dijkstra's algorithm to run once, n Dijkstra's algorithm is order n cubed. Does everybody see that? Any questions? In the interest of time, I'm going to move on and not tell you about it, even though it's amazingly slick. And maybe I'll tell you later. There is an algorithm for solving all pairs shortest path that runs an n squared time that is exactly that long, four lines long. Okay? And um, um, let me let me just tell it to you without your hopes of you understanding it. And then then you, if you understand it, that's good. If not. What are we going to do? We're going to compute a function dij. That is the distance from i to j where there's a superscript here, k. That means you're allowed to use vertices 1 through k as intermediaries. Okay, So let's come up with a world where we have a graph here. All the vertices are numbers, right? We're going to compute the distance from i to j, where we're allowed to use vertices 1 through k as intermediaries. What is the shortest path from i to j if we're not allowed to use anybody as an intermediary? Let's think about that. Suppose you want to know the shortest path from i to j where you're not allowed to go through any other vertex. 
What is that? Yeah? The, the weight of the edge from I to J. That's right. What if there is no edge from I to J? What? Then it's infinite, right? It's an infinite distance, right? If I can't swim, it's an infinite distance from me, you know, if I'm an Alcatraz in San Francisco, right? Any questions? Now, what if I'm allowed to use every vertex as an intermediary? What is the shortest path from I to J where I can use the entire graph as intermediary? What is that length going to be? I claim it's the shortest path from I to J, right? Normally, to get from I to J, either, you know, I go through some subset of vertices, right? Maybe it's empty, maybe it's everybody. If I'm allowed to use everybody at the end, it should be clear that the shortest path from I to J using everybody as an intermediary gives me the shortest path from I to J. Now, here's the question. If I know the shortest path from I to J, using vertices from 1 to k minus 1 as a possible intermediary. And now I allow you to use another vertex k. How might there be the shortest path from i to j? OK? Suppose I knew the shortest path from i to j using only 1 through k minus 1 as candidates for intermediate points. Now, suppose, let's say, I'm allowed to use vertex k as an intermediary. What new option is there for me to get to? Yeah? There could be some path from i to k plus some path from k to j. Does everybody agree with that? So what is the shortest path? My claim is going to be that the shortest path using the first k vertices as an intermediary is either the shortest path not using vertex k, meaning the first k minus 1 is intermediary, or the shortest path from i to k using k minus one is intermediary, plus the shortest path from k to j using k minus one is intermediary. Does everybody see that? OK. Either I'm going to use, you give me an extra detour. Either I'm going to be using it or I'm not, right? And it's going to be the best of these possibilities. Any questions about that? If you believe that, the amazing thing is this four-line algorithm updates it, where we're going to find the shortest path from i to j for all i to j, using at first zero intermediaries, then one, then two, then three, dot, dot, dot. If you look at it, there are three nested loops and a constant amount of time in this last operation, right? It's just a constant times test. If you get in, think about this, because this is an amazing thing. And in fact, you can now find all shortest paths using this thing called Floyd's algorithm in n cubed algorithm of time, amazingly split. Any questions? Look in the book if you're interested. Any questions about that? OK? So bottom line, we now know how to compute shortest paths. OK? And shortest paths are good things to know how to compute. Any questions? Any questions at all? OK. Let's now look at what the problem of the day was. Again, we're a little out of sync, unfortunately. OK. Let's go to the file. OK. Let's go back and look at now at what the problem of the day was, just to sort of 
make sure we're up to this thing. Suppose I want to solve the single destination shortest path. Okay? Single source shortest path told me, given a graph, I want to find the shortest path from S to everybody else. Does everybody agree with that? Now, suppose that I am given a directed graph. Suppose I want to find the shortest path from every vertex to a specified vertex, right? We agree that all roads lead to Rome. Does everybody remember hearing that, right? So suppose, let's say that that's true, then somehow every, from every city, we should be able to get to Rome. How would you find the shortest path from every body to a particular destination efficiently? Um, see what the problem is? Dijkstra's algorithm told me, what was the shortest path from one vertex to everybody else? Now I want to find the same vertex from everybody else to me. Yeah, what? Does everybody see that that's all that you have to do? Okay. If we had a directed graph, all roads led to Rome, right? But Dijkstra's algorithm wants to go from Rome. What if we turn around every edge? So if there was an edge like this of weight 5, we turn around the gra ed graph. So the edges go in the other direction with the same weights. Is it then clear that if there is a path from here to here of weight 100, in the edge reverse graph, there has to be a, a path from here to here of weight 100? Right? Does everybody see that? may seem obvious now. How would we take a graph and reverse all the edges? Let's think about that. How much time does it take to reverse the edges in a graph? You say zero. I don't believe that it's zero, okay? Because I think if I gave you a graph here, this big graph here, okay? You know, you, to do anything on something with n vertices isn't zero. What? Well, you say the answer is it's not. You say just treat the forward edges as backwards. That is not clear in a directed graph. Suppose in, a direct, in an undirected graph, an edge from me to you implies there's one from you to me, right? Let's look at this particular adjacency list. Here was one where I could go from vertex 1 to 2, 3, and 4. The adjacency list from this, if it was a directed graph, looked like what? From 1, I can go to 2. I can go to 3, I can go to 4. 2, 3, and 4, where can I go? Nowhere. Reversing the edges means what? Okay? It means constructing the, the list that looks like this. One can now go where? Nowhere, right? But 2 goes to 1. 3 goes to 1, and 4 goes to 1. Does everybody see that? This is what reversing the graph does. It is not a zero time algorithm, right? You run Dijkstra's algorithm on this thing. It does you no good starting from 1, right? You can't get from 1 anywhere. Boom, done. Okay? On here, it makes a big difference. If I stored it as an adjacency matrix, then you are right in saying that by simply reversing the roles of x and y, then I would get the effect of turning it around. Does everybody agree with that? So in an adjacency matrix, by swapping the indices, I would reverse all the edges. And I wouldn't have to do anything. But do you see that in an adjacency list structure, 
it's not quite so simple. Okay? Any questions about that? Now, how would I do this? Okay? How would you build, given this? Can someone suggest an algorithm? This is had n plus m was the size of this data structure. How would you go about constructing the reverse graph? Okay? It's something that should be concrete. Let's think about it. How do we do it? Yes. What? Reversing the pointers won't do it exactly. Because remember, look, I, this, do we agree that if I took this graph, this thing here is the reverse of this thing? Do you agree with that? Is this just a question of reversing pointers? I have to do something, right? Yes. So the way that I would do this is I would start out with a virgin adjacency list, an empty graph, right? And now I would cruise through this thing and add the edges as I encounter them, right? Cruise this thing, one to two. Hmm, that must mean add something to this. Cruise through this one, one to three. Hmm. One to four, hmm, empty, empty, empty. Does everybody see that? Okay. That would be order n plus m to turn the graph around. And now I've got this reversed graph. Okay. Any questions about that? This is a good one to make sure you know. Just because this is a simple, concrete thing with these graphs. Part of you may be lost in this sea of, of where are these pointers and what's going on. This is concrete. This is what's actually you're doing with the data structure. Okay? And maybe here you can see the concreteness. All right? Any questions about that? Okay? This is just data in a graph. Any questions about this single destination path problem? Okay? Any questions here? Okay, good. The next thing that we're going to talk about in here is going to be about um, backtracking. Yeah, question. You love Sudoku. Okay, good. Okay, who here loves Sudoku? Okay, who here play, has played Sudoku but doesn't love it? Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, so what is Sudoku? Now so many people are excited, okay? What is Sudoku, okay? Sudoku is this puzzle that had suddenly burst on into the world a few years ago, okay? And um, it's a numbered, it's this grid of numbers that's partially completed, okay? And um, what your job is somehow is to fill in, it's, it's a nine by nine in its standard configuration a nine by nine grid of numbers, okay, where it's div divided into nine three by three boxes. And a satisfied Sudoku problem is one where you have written numbers into each of these 81 spots with the property that in every one of these nine boxes, the numbers 1 through 9 appear exactly once. In every row, column, the numbers 1 through 9 appear exactly once. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, bingo. And in every row, the numbers 1 through 9 appear exactly once. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay? Any questions? So what is Sudoku? Okay? You are given this. Okay? And you want to fill it in so you get that. Now, why do you want to do it? God knows. But people seem to want to do it. Okay? Any questions here? The people, people see that. It's a puzzle, right? People find it very satisfying to do this kind of thing, okay? 
People historically do a lot of it in the back of my class, okay? It was no surprise, I think, I saw everyone in the back of the class rose their hand when they said Sudoku, like Sudoku. Okay, so it's this big time, time sink that people have to fill in this matrix, right? Now, how do you do Sudoku? What makes Sudoku hard or interesting for someone who loves Sudoku? Okay, yes. Okay, so you're saying here that in order to do this thing, you're making a guess, okay? And that one way to solve the Sudoku problem is to make guesses, okay? So I could say, okay, this is a good place. I'll put a three in here. Is that a good guess or a bad guess? Bad guess. Why is that a bad guess? It breaks a rule. There's no hope that I'm going to be able to put a three here. What might I be able to put there instead? Let's think about it. What could I put here? You say four, okay, well let me think what I could put in here, okay? I can't, I one, let's come back here. I've got the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm gonna put one of those here, right? You say I can put a three. Can I put a five? Can't put a five. Can I put a six? Can't put a six. Can't put a four. Can't put a one. Somebody was telling me put a four there, but they were just lying, trying to, 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 to disillusion me, right? I have to, I can't violate a row or a column or this box, okay? So I'm not allowed to put in a one, a four, or a six. I'm not allowed to put in a three or a five or I'm not allowed to put in a three or a five or a six. Does everybody see that? I could put in, in theory, any one of those numbers without causing a problem. So you're saying guess. And when you then guess, what happens? You then keep going. Does everybody see that? And what happens eventually is you, you realize you guessed wrong. And then you start erasing things. Is that what you do when you do school? Who here, I mean, does everybody, do people have to erase when they do Sudoku? Or are some people so good they don't have to erase? You don't have to erase? Okay. In principle, the idea seems to be, now maybe if you're very good at this, it's different. Okay. But somehow that there is this vision that to solve a Sudoku puzzle, what you are really doing is you're putting things into the puzzle. Okay. And, um, you are guessing on possibilities, seeing what the ripple effect of those, the consequences of those things are. And so long as there are no contradictions, you keep moving. Otherwise, you step back, erase things, and go till you haven't made any mistakes. Does everybody see that that's sort of the vision of Sudoku? Okay? So what we are gonna do for the next section in the course Okay, implicitly is Sudoku. Okay, I'll make you interested in it. Or more generally, an algorithm for, we're not going to do Sudoku, don't worry about that. Okay, but we're going to look at the problem of how do you solve problems where there is searching implicit in it, where there are a lot of configurations that you might try. Okay, any questions? Okay. What would be the worst possible Sudoku algorithm of all? Let's just get this as a, uh, this is a warm up. What would be the worst possible Sudoku algorithm, yeah? Fill in the entire board, one. One, 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 one. And then at the end say, gee, do I have any problems? Does everybody see that? Oh look, I have a problem. Maybe I will now go and, array and now put in a different combination of all the numbers. Does every, and then see if I have a problem. Does everybody see that one way I could solve it that would be very, very dumb would be to fill in all the numbers and then see at the end if it's any good. The key to efficient Sudoku solving. 
to doing it in the back of the class before lecture ends is to note that you're going to be putting them in and looking for contradictions and backing up when you have a contradiction. Okay? And this is going to be the idea behind backtracking. Okay? Which is what we are going to talk about in the next class. Any questions about Sudoku, how you solve it, or what, what our basic vision is for the future? Okay? So finish up the homework, get that in next time, and next time we'll talk about combinatorial search in, in serious. Okay, thank you.